Greetings, friends. Greetings, new friends. I had a very busy 2018. I circumnavigated the globe twice, and I was fortunate to satisfy my curiosity as an investor to look at these themes with evidence. I burn the shoe leather. I talk with the people. I use my personal experience to fortify what is going to be my 2019 theme that, in my view, global energy is at a hinge of history. This is a very profound statement, but if we go through the evidence, I think you too, you too will be enlightened from my global travels. In October of 1879, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, the first commercially successful one what would become this electric light bulb. And his patron was John Pierpont Morgan. And it took a couple years, but his home, J.P. Morgan, was the first house to be electrified. And he invited the who's who of New York City society and finance, and Thomas Edison was present, and he flicked the switch, and he said, welcome to the age of electricity. Those people left, and J.P. Morgan was around 44 at the time. His father, who was the, really the person of the house of Morgan, he said, son, how can you embarrass yourself in front of all these people? They did not believe that this trick, this electrification, would disrupt energy. But of course it did. In just 10 or 15 years, it would supplant kerosene, which was petroleum. John D. Rockefeller was the richest person in the world at the time, and they were effectively refining oil. They used to throw the gasoline away. There was no purpose for it. It was the illuminant of the American economy. And so all of a sudden it became very important. And then what happens on January 10th of 1901? Anton Lucic, a Croatian immigrant, would discover oil in South Texas at Spindletop. This was the world's first true oil gusher. 100,000 barrels a day. What would they do with all this oil? Of course, we all know the answer. It was the internal combustion engine and it was the, the motorization that complemented the illuminant of the global economy. We went, as a society, from the animal age to the motor age. And there was two types of motorization to this very day. You have the internal combustion engine and electric motors. And we are now, as I stated in the beginning, at a hinge of history. So if you go forward with these commodities, there were a couple times over the past 120 years where oil was, was literally worthless. So much was found at a couple different times and there was just not enough demand. And it would reach its climax at the end of the, at the, end of, the, the, of the last century. You can see here, this is a graph since World War II of the price of oil and the all-time low on an inflation-adjusted basis was in 1999. In fact, The Economist magazine on their cover, March 6th, they would say the world was drowning in oil. In fact, they predicted $5 a barrel, if you can believe it. But they got it wrong. All the analysts, all the forecasts, all the spreadsheets were wrong. They couldn't have been more wrong because they forgot about these people. You see, all the models worked with the OECD and Japan. They looked at this small club of developed nations and they looked at the research and they said that we're doomed. But the other five billion people, the emerging markets, and if we saw what happened in China, where their GDP would go from one and a half trillion to now $14 trillion, nobody saw that coming. Look at the difference from 1980. 31, 32x differential for the average person in China. If you haven't been there, you don't appreciate the magnitude of this. My name is Johnny Kovacevic. I'm an expert in energy, understanding the, the jurisdictional differences in global energy. I'm an analyst and an investor in the applications, but my background is in electrical studies, power systems. So all these things that I studied at the British Columbia Institute of Technology are now becoming commercially viable. 
If you cut them in half, I know how they operate. And that's really important because it helps you to articulate, I think, the winners and losers in this hinge of history. Don Cox is someone that changed my life. And anyone here, by a show of hands, that read his basic points, this was a must read in financial circles. And he too told everyone, those experts, you're getting it wrong. And his basic points of October of 2003, he told them. And remember, in 1980, 20% of the stocks, sorry, 35% of the stocks on the S&P were commodity stocks. By the time he got to that oil collapse at the end of 99-2000, uh, only 5%. Very few analysts in the business. So if we go back to what he was saying, it was going to be a reflation trade for all commodities because he said there's a new invisible hand in the demand of everything. And it's the 5 billion people that are being lifted out of abject poverty. So I share with you a chart of oil and copper going back 20 years to that same time at the end of 99, early 2000. Oil and copper are correlated 90% of the time. There's the chart. Never argue with the chart. And so when he came out with his first prognostication that money, general capital, should start allocating more into commodities, he was right. You can see the green arrow. Everything had moved up. But they were cr climbing this wall of worry. And on his February 26 issue, which was supply side mineral economics, the, the, the miners and the people in the oil and gas business were terrified that society could not absorb such a price increase. And we have. We've paid an average of $3 a pound for copper for the past 13, 14 years. Then we get to the pre-2008 financial crisis, and people now say, Don Cox got it wrong. Everything collapsed, except the rules changed. You need to fundamentally understand what's happened in commodities, with consumer behavior, and with these two specific kings of energy, the incumbent system, or the commodity of the last 100 years, oil, and the commodity for the next 100 years, which is electrification, copper. Copper has never left its bull market. You can see that if you were to draw an imaginary line between these bottoms, you would see that it's still intact. But other things have changed. The extraction of oil. I'm going to suggest to you, and this is what I'm known for, copper and oil have decoupled. Before three years ago, over 90% of the time they were directly correlated, or to put it a different way, copper waited for oil to make a move. Not anymore. Look at the chart. Because of engineering, and I'm going to show you this, we're going to walk through the details. The engineering tells us that you will not have new copper production unless the copper price goes significantly higher. It's not the will. You have lots of that in Lima, lots of that in Santiago, my friends. It's the money. It's the money. And I'll show you these statistics. I'm getting a lot of attention now. I was just in New York City. I was in Toronto last week and I did the Economic Outlook for Canada with David Rosenberg one of the key economists in North America. The meetings I take now with very wealthy people, people that manage big money, it's an hour and a half, two hour meeting, because they're fascinated by this hiding in plain sight. If the future is electricity, and electricity is enabled by copper and aluminum, obviously this should break down. 61% of oil is consumed by the internal combustion engine. And it's not the electric car. It's a collaboration of things, including consumer behavior and the efficiency of the internal combustion engine. This is the biggest, biggest problem they have. But of course, at the margin, we are going into electrified transportation. We could use Lee Iacocca now. He transformed Chrysler, and more so than ever, that industry, that entire industry, is going through more than one existential threat. People are saying that car sales are falling in China and in the United States. Don't be alarmed by this. There are tens of millions of young people who never obtained a driver's license. 
They will never become a customer of Big Auto. They want access and they want no part of ownership. During the strongest economy since World War II, car sales fell. And the headline you get out of China, car sales falling. No, no, that's because tens of millions of young people in China, they want no part of this nonsense. They want access, they don't want ownership. So the experts tell us for the future of oil demand will continue to grow, and there's a bit of disagreement there between the various experts. But when you start layering in fuel switching, consumer behavior, adoption, the electric car, look at the delta. What will come, I don't know. But what you need to worry about as an investor is that the CAGR demand growth of this product, which is so special, is not gonna grow anymore. There's no more growth in demand. Now what happens in the next two, three, four years? I don't really care. But in the long run, not, no longer a growth business. I'm pretty comfortable that this will take place because of the situation you have in cities all over the world. When you eliminate emissions, the collateral benefit is cleaner cities. I don't think this is for debate. You wanna talk about climate change, that's a different discussion for a different day. I'm talking about particulate pollution. You can only alleviate this by eliminating emissions. These are the countries that export oil and they rely on it for export income. The focus is the countries that aren't present. You need to think of the industrial superpowers of the world that don't have access to these things. I speak of Japan, growing India, China, Israel, Croatia, Switzerland, Germany, Italy, the other guys. They now have the ability in the next 5, 10, 15 years to make a plan to slowly but surely alleviate their dependence on this product. So there's the reserves. This is Mohammed bin Salman al Saud and there are six or seven sovereigns that have 100 years of reserves based at their current output. Now, if you think the big oil companies have a problem, those are the CEOs of all the guys on the bottom, you see them, they run the big oil companies. Did you know that the pivot of all these leaders, they know too that the way you refine a barrel of oil is important and that's the future of their business. Ben Van Buren of Shell, Darren Woods of Exxon, Patrick Pouillon of Total, Michael Worth of Chevron. Did you know that every one of them cut their teeth in refining and petrochemicals? Every one. Because they know in the future, you will refine a barrel of oil into an enhanced product. Less and less so in transportation fuels, more and more so plastics, petrochemicals, and electrons. Shell has declared that in the future they will be 75% natural gas because in the words of Ben Van Buren, I will sell people electrons. They already de they're declaring this already. The other problem they have is a renaissance in the way we extract this product. They reinvented the wheel. The marriage of horizontal fracking happened in 2002 when George Mitchell married with Devon Energy and Larry Nichols. And the rest, they say, is history. Look at the production rates in the United States. They are now the world's largest producer of oil, and they're not looking back. They have barely made a dent in going uh, outside of North America. And if you simply look at the blue line, oil production, and the pink line, how much petroleum products do they import? Here's an update. In December, they were a net exporter. For three generations, they were reliant on foreign oil. No more. And they know this. Those people with 100 years of reserves are well aware of this trend. So let's talk a little bit about the copper business. There has been no such renaissance in the exploration of copper and in the extraction of copper. What you're looking here is going back to the golden era of exploration. The gold line is how much money we as an industry collectively spent on exploration, over $100 billion. The blue bars are the success that we have had as an industry. Very little. 
totally different than the oil and gas business. So what's going on with the copper price? People are so fixated with the trade war and what could be a hiccup in the global economy, they're missing the new invisible hand in this hinge of history, which is an incredible increase in electricity as final energy. The blue bars, which you can basically see, at the same time that the copper price has fallen, in sympathy with this trade war rhetoric, the copper price has fallen with it. How can I share with people that aren't petroleum engineers or people that are in the copper mining business the magnificence of electrification? I do this through a video now because it's so much easier. Remember, 19% of final energy today is electricity. And in the next 30 years, that number will climb to 50%. But it's true, but it's true. Almost everything you buy has an electrical cord stuck at the back of it, but now comes the things that consume huge, huge amounts of energy. This is the single most important chart that you're gonna view in my presentation and perhaps in this entire event. You're gonna go, what took 120 years is gonna be compressed in, the, in approximately the next 30 years electrification becomes about 50% of global energy. You do not need to get a pencil and paper to worry about the CAGR growth rate for demand for the enabler of this electrification. It will be way higher than the 100 year average. You can look throughout this metric, and of course it takes 500% more copper on average to enable these things that use a large amount of energy when they're not fossil fuels. Offshore wind, 10 times more copper. So I don't spend too much time talking about demand. I like to talk about the opportunity and where's it gonna come from. For other people, there's also the per capita usage. In the developing world, there's still gonna be more copper per person. So if the CAGR growth rate will be muted in oil, it's gonna be around four or 5%, maybe 3% in times of uh, recession. The world's oil supply comes from four and a half million individual wells, but when I tell my folks or my friends in the, in the incumbent energy space, that primary copper comes from effectively 20 mines give us 45% of primary copper. The shocking statistic is the average discovery year was 1928. We haven't had a lot of success. If you have 100 years of reserves, and a lot of companies have 40 or 50 or 60 years of reserves, if you took all the copper reserves we have right now at this copper price, you have less than 20 years, less, in a growing CAGR demand growth rate. Now we have lots of copper, we found a lot, but it's low grade. 2010, the 15 largest copper producers put 1.2% copper through their mills. I know that's irrelevant if you're not a mining engineer, but if you have one cubic kilometer of that rock, the grade is lower and lower. They have not had a renaissance in copper mining. Haven't had one. It takes a lot more energy and effort for far less metal yield. So I argue with people, even in this industry, they believe that there's lots of high-grade stuff out there. Oh, we'll be just fine. You don't know, it's not, in the, um, not on your list. Here are the 14 largest copper producers and the red demarcation line, the line you're looking at here, shows you that their reserve base is about 0 0.6, 0 0.62. 
But if you look at the future projects, there's the 19 largest development projects. Don't get confused by the data. I always do a pictorial for you. It's much easier that way. I will use a demarcation line of 0.5% copper. Almost everything. Go down the food chain. Here's the next 30 projects. So you have to agree with me that the future of copper will be 0.4 or 0.5. If I have 1% copper ore, which we don't have, but I'm just being hypothetical, at $3 copper, it's worth $66 a ton. The reason I'm suggesting to you that copper will su uh, surpass its old all-time high, it's the engineering. It's the engineering. It's an insurance policy. We spent a hundred billion looking for more copper. All we found was lots of this. It is not economic. You don't need to do a feasibility study. At $3 copper, the vast majority of the future production does not work. So this will continue to decouple. And you will see the copper price, as Robert Friedland says, coming to a theater near you in that orange box. And any commodity that trends higher like that, specifically if it goes past its old all-time high, when it's on the cover of Barron's or the cover of the Wall Street Journal, believe me, you as a junior mining investor, you want to already be invested. The mania will be out of the bag. So the analysts, and with all the trade talk, Mike Tyson used to say that everyone has a plan until they're punched in the face. We're on an onion skin with supply and demand. One little thing goes wrong, and all of a sudden, all the anal analysis goes out the window. Last year was the luckiest year in a generation for supply disruption in the copper business. That's not gonna duplicate itself. The second largest copper mine, Grasberg, announced last week, that is they transition underground, they're gonna produce 85% less copper concentrate. No one cared. They will as the year runs through. In the next three years, we don't have any new copper mines coming online. Cobra Panama was commissioned end of last year, going into this year. We got a three year window, nothing big coming. Hard to save the day. So I am a contrarian. And that's what we do. In my company, Copper Bank, with which many people know, I buy from pessimists and I aim to sell to optimists. Our share price over the past three years, the last time copper moved 40%, our share price moved 400%. There are people in this room that have followed the story, maybe you missed that. So if you believe that copper prices could be stronger in the future, you wanna look at Copper Bank as a proxy We've fallen in sympathy with the market, but it has, it, it's demonstrated a disproportionate um, correlation in positive copper prices. So while the market was in a negative down, uh, down, uh, down world, we've been buying projects. And we acquired Red Hawk in August. Previous market cap high was 120 million. $85 million spent on the project, 220,000 meters of drilling. And here's the chart of Red Hawk over 10 years. That's my purchase price. We are not crying in our beer at Copper Bank because the market is in a bear market. We look to do highly accretive partnerships and transactions. Do a tabulation of how much copper you had per share before the transaction. And if you come to my booth at, um, in the corner of, the, of row 1000, I'll articulate what we own. Trading at six or seven cents. So that's opportunity number one. Speculation number two is Desert Mountain Energy. And I encourage you to do some due diligence on this because helium is in a bull market. The price of helium is now trading at $279 in MCF, yet it costs about the same to drill for helium as it does for natural gas. So Desert Mountain Energy, and if you can read a chart, you can see where this chart is going. They're gonna drill three exploration wells in the first half of this year. If they are successful, 
and they are 2,500 feet from the most prolific helium well in America, they're in a very good location. So I own this stock. I'm speculating that there's gonna be interest in what they do. So I have here a one pager, which I will leave here and you can all grab one and do some research on Desert Mountain Energy. For disclosure, I own it. Speculation number three is a brand new company and they're showcasing for the first time here at the show. I love brand new companies because the share structure is very tight. Nobody sells their shares. And their focus is electric metals. They're gonna build an electric metals company. Now, I don't know exactly which commodities they're gonna get into, probably vanadium and lithium and things like that, but you can read a chart. They're at the show. And I'm speculating that this company is gonna do progressive things in the year 2019 and 2020. You can buy the stock and it's got a tiny share count, I think less, less than 30 million shares out. And most of that is in a filing cabinet with the people involved in the company. You can speculate and buy this at 20 cents. They live in Vancouver, you can get on their list and they've actually kindly purchased a bunch of my books and they have their bookmark and in their booth 639, you can get a free copy of my book, get on their mailing list, and find out what are they gonna do in this electric metal space. But it's a new issuer, and it's a company I think you wanna follow, right? On that note, my time is up. That's the hardcover edition of my book. Um, I wish everyone happy investing, and I'll be at the end of row 1000 for the next two days, thank you.